I'm Michael Morris, Superintendent of Schools for the Amherst Public Schools, and this is the latest episode of Window into ARPS. And for today's episode, it's a little bit of a special episode, uh, a little different format today, but with me today is the Town Manager of Amherst, Paul Bachman. so thank you for coming. My pleasure. And today's topic is the, the recent, uh, the MSBA process. So the Town of Amherst was, got some re fortunate news last month um, in December. And as the MSBA sees this as uh, all projects as a partnership between the towns and municipalities and then school districts, this is something Paul and I have talked a lot about and will continue to talk about for the next uh, five to seven years. And we thought it'd be really good to have you on and be able to share with the community um, some questions that I know you're receiving and that I'm receiving as well so that the community gets some accurate information of where we are in the process, what to look forward to, uh, and how to become involved. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much for uh, taking time out of your day to, to join us. Um, so we'll start with uh, on December 11th, both of us were uh, at the MSBA, a little snowy morning, uh, their headquarters in Boston, and what was your first response to the news that the town of Amherst would be invited uh, back into the MSBA process? Yes, it was a snowy morning in Boston, sounds like the beginning of a short story. Um, <laughs> our state representative Mindy Dom was there too as well That's with right. us to, to share the news. Um, I was thrilled, a little bit shocked I have to say. Um, the blunt reality of the challenge became pretty apparent. Um, but I think that the reason we got in was because we had made a clear articulation of the need for the new building. And it's kind of unusual to be out of the program and then get right back in. But I think the, the real fact is that the, the needs of the district haven't changed. Uh, that that you and the school school committee had done a really good job at articulating that need to the to the MSBA. Um, I think that the statement from the town council that they had voted unanimously to support the project meant that all elected and appointed officials of the town were in sync on this project, and that that made a big difference to the MSBA. Uh, they made a site visit in advance of their decision and we were able to show a united um, front in a way by saying that you know, the elected officials and the appointed officials were standing shoulder to shoulder in support of this project. And I think um, the, art, the clear articulation of the need along with the political support of the town made it an easy call for them. Yeah, and, and I'll add to that, I think uh, another thing that mattered to the MSP, and we both heard this, was the level of engagement that the school committee and town council had last, almost a year ago mm, actually. Right. Um, there were nine listening sessions, three for staff, six for the community, and the attendance was very high of both school committee members, but also town councilors. Mm -hmm. While the school committee was hosting the event, they reached out and it, it was you know, one of the first probably big things that town councilors who were recently elected jumped mm -hmm. into, but they jumped in with both feet and yep. heard from the community, they were well attended, and. We heard a lot from the community about the need. Uh, I was just reading an article this morning about another community in Massachusetts that um, was in the pipeline, didn't have a successful process, and is trying to get in. A and is a bit at wit's end mm -hmm. with what to do because they didn't get in in December. Mm -hmm. They weren't as fortunate as we were. And I think one of the things that really stood out to the MSBA was, as you said, the partnership between mm -hmm. the town and the schools and the level of engagement with the larger community. Mm -hmm. It wasn't, you know, 13 people or five people uh, sitting around saying we need to do this. It really got the voices of many more people into that process. So um, thank you, and, and, for, and you were very present at those mm -hmm. uh, sessions as well. So thank you uh, for all your work on that. So one of the questions I get often is, what's the timeline for everything coming up? So this is, I'm sort of interviewing you now. It's <laughs> a, right. a two-way street, so, uh, and you know this a lot better than anybody in town. So what is the timeline for this project moving forward? Right, so I think uh, I'll start with the meta and then I'll go to the micro. So uh, I, one of the things we heard both at the listening sessions a year ago, but also the recent listening sessions that um, the town council organized, and I think that was also in December mm -hmm. last month, were, was the urgency. And certainly I feel the urgency. I think I've been on record for numerous times talking about the urgency, as have you. And one of the challenging things for the MSBA is every community that applies, and particularly every community that gets in, also feels urgency. We're not mm -hmm. unique in that regard. And one of the concerns they'd expressed in the past is some communities have tried to rush the process. So we've already done all that work. We're, we can just you know, bypass this. And the MSBA has been very clear with us, as well as every other community, that the process takes five to seven years for a reason. It's not a bureaucratic reason. It's actually to get the best outcome. These buildings are supposed to last 50 years. To do that, they, they are supportive to every district and thinking, thing, thinking about the things that perhaps architects and the towns 
have not thought of to ensure the quality is high. The reason the MSB was created is its predecessor was not seen as being successful in, a, in accomplishing those ends. And so they've built in safeguards. So uh, at, a, at a larger level, the soonest the MSBA will vote on uh, funding our project would be the summer of 2022. Um, so about two and a half years from when we're taping this show. And the soonest that, you know, sort of design development and construction could occur is another two and a half years, um, assuming the town supported the funding um, that the MSBA um, granted. So the soonest we'd walking into an, uh, a new or renovated building would be the fall of 2025. Um, and that's in the best of situation, best of circumstances, process runs smoothly, uh, Construction type is quick, uh, the quicker of the quicker variety, uh, really, and that's the five to seven years could be uh, any a couple years slower than that. On the more proximate end of things, uh, we officially enter the enrollment period on May 1st, 2020. And that process is around building a, having a school building committee formed, um, enrollment projections, which is more of the, the district side, working with the MSBA, identifying funding for the feasibility study. It's a lot of technical tasks um, to show that we're ready to enter feasibility. And, and that um, the enrollment period can last up to 270 days. I think I'm optimistic, as are you, that we'll be a little quicker than that and we can enter feasibility uh, without 270 days going by. But the reason they have that time is they want um, two reasons. One is they want districts and towns to be able to organize themselves to enter a five to seven year intensive process. And I think the second reason, too, is that they want to set the, the marker at the beginning that this is a deliberate process, that there aren't mistakes made, that uh, throughout everything we're communicating frequently with the MSBA and vice versa so that we start with the pace that's going to be consistent throughout. So I think we can get through the enrollment phase faster than 270 days, but they want to build that in for communities to, to get organized uh, because the intensive stuff really starts right after that feasibility where you're hiring architects and designers and owners, project managers, and, and getting to see uh, nice models that look, likely look a lot different than our current schools look uh, mm -hmm. inside. So uh, on the short end, we get in May 1st. We'll start with that. Uh, enrollment period on the larger end, five to seven years, so 2025 to 27, yeah. to be in a new renovated building. And that is the MSBA's process, and we can only move as fast as they allow us to move. Exactly. There's a number of uh, gating moments. Uh, by gating, I mean where we have submissions to the MSBA that need to be approved before we're advanced into the next phase of the process. And, and again, uh, the enrollment period is no different. They need to approve our enrollment and come to kind of uh, what that means is taking a look at enrollment projections and saying, what are you going to study? We know that we had this you know, 600 student school that was in our statement of interest. We're going to study other options as well and come into a resolution on what those other options are. Mm -hmm. uh, school building committee needs to be approved again, uh, mm -hmm. and we'll talk about that in a second. And then the funding needs to be in place to enter that next phase. It gets increasingly more complex throughout the process where there's architectural submissions that, are, that go through. Uh, for instance, even picking the designer, the architect, uh, is something that the MSBA manages at a subcommittee meeting that they run, that we're allowed three members at. So uh, throughout that entire process, there's always approvals by MSBA before next steps are taken. Mm -hmm. yeah. Good. And so um, I'll turn the tables again. Uh, what are some steps the town can or is taking right now to prepare for this process? Mm -hmm. So you already mentioned the forming of a building committee. Uh, so that's one thing we can get started on. Uh, I think one of the key questions for the town will be whether we um, have this building built to our local bylaw net zero standards or not. And that's a question I think the town council will need to address. And then um, relatively in the, in the next few months, we will ask the town council to appropriate funds for a feasibility study. Um, and I, I know the district has already taken some steps to um, started uh, uh, publicizing this as well. Yes, yeah, and we'll continue to do so. Yeah, so you have a website set up for the for the project. Yeah, um, and we're doing events like this mm -hmm. uh, to share with the larger community. Uh, we'll certainly be talking about it at every school committee meeting, I would say indefinitely for five to seven years, <laughs> um, and, and I think less so uh, as, a, as a constant topic at town council, but I imagine it'll still, it'll mm -hmm. come up from time to time. And uh, which, what we're and connecting you know, with please, staff and connecting with staff. So I've already met with um, the staff. <coughs> so we had optional meetings at Crocker Farm, Wildwood, and Fort River. So that staff are kept abreast of this. We're working. And one of the pieces I want particular feedback from staff on is 
how can staff members stay engaged in a leadership role without necessarily being on a building committee? Mm -hmm. um, it, t our teachers are working incredible hours as it is. Um, and so I got great ideas from staff members at those schools about okay. uh, kind of what a steering committee might look like and how can staff members be engaged in the part that makes sense to get feedback mm -hmm. uh, deeply and then for some other things perhaps you know let the process run through and, and that it wouldn't have to be um, as intensive again uh, many hours mm -hmm. as a building committee and so I think we're going to put something together uh, actually in our budget in the Amherst um, elementary school budget to support that. We want our staff members involved like we want the community, but there has to be some acknowledgement of they're wearing multiple hats and mm -hmm. there's only so many hours of day and the most critical role that all of us play is, is advancing the, the, the education of children. And, right. um, so we're, we're, we're working on all those things and, and trying to prepare as best we can so that when we're formally in the process, um, it's very clear to everyone where we are in the process, what the next steps are, who's involved, who's making which decision, and how input can be gathered. Mm -hmm. That's great. Yeah. So speaking of building school building committee, since this falls on your side of the table, so to speak, mm -hmm. um, you know, who will be on the building committee and what's the role of that body and what, sort of what's the process of mm -hmm. getting on a town committee as per mm -hmm. the, uh, the, the charter? Mm -hmm. So first, as you noted, the MSBA controls this part of this as well. They have definite roles that need to be filled on the, on the building committee. For instance, the school principal must be on it. There must be a, a member of the school committee on it. The superintendent has to be on it, et cetera. Um, under our town chart, but the appointment process actually uh, goes to how the town does appointments. Under our new town charter, the town manager is responsible for appointing members to all multiple member bodies. So I would approach that the same way I've done with all the other appointments that the town has done uh, in the first year of the charter. Um, before, before we start recruiting people, um, we will work on a um, charge for the committee that will outline exactly what the committee is to do, what its responsibility is, how many people will be on, what sectors of the community they will represent, what the time commitment is and when they were likely to meet so that everybody who, anybody who's interested in serving on the committee will have a clear picture of what they're, uh, what they're committing to when they put their name forward. And as you said, it's a five to seven year committee. It's a five to seven year commitment if people are willing to do that long. So um, that's the first step. That's a charge that I would ask the town council to review and the school committee obviously to review to make sure we're all on the same page before we start recruiting members. members. Then we'll do outreach to make sure we have a very broad and diverse pool of people. And once we have a pool that we feel is adequate and, and, rep and representative, I'll follow the same process that I've done on other appointments, which is a key person for yourself, the superintendent, and I, and a member of the Residence Advisory Committee will meet with everybody who puts their name forward. Uh, the Residence Advisory Committee is a committee that was established by the Charter. Um, it, it is members of the community who advise the town manager on appointments. Uh, this committee for our town um, has um, Jim Pistrang, who's the chair of it, Connie Kruger, former select board member, and Keisha Dennis, who's a member of the, mem of the public, who are all serve as members of the Residence Advisory Committee, and they're all very excellent at, their, uh, at this process. Once I make the appointments, those names are referred to the town council. The town council has 30 days to either approve the appointments, disapprove the appointments, or take no action, in which case, at the end of 30 days, the appointments become effective. Great, thank you. So. That's a really thorough explanation of a, a question that I'm getting all the time. So yeah. I now have a clip, a video clip. I will have a video clip to refer people to, which is, which is great. Um, and I think you've yeah. So so one of the questions that people will say, I mean, if I don't have time, I can't make the commitment to serving on the building committee. Um, what are ways that I can stay engaged and be informed about this process? Yeah, so uh, we do have a website and that'll be across the bottom of the screen uh, for people to, to be able to view and it's gonna update with agendas, um, minutes of meetings of what happened, but also ways to offer feedback throughout the process. Um, additionally, there'll be organized forums, multiple forums throughout the process so that community members can come uh, have their views heard, uh, as well as the public comment at building committee meetings. Um, but I think the forums are much more intentional where there's more um, two-way uh, give and take and uh, they're explicitly, the explicit focus is, is to have committee members' feedback included. We'll continue to do, whether it's me and you or we'll figure mm -hmm. out this, uh, we're going to continue to do window into ARPS throughout the process mm -hmm. so that 
Um, it's another vehicle by which, and thank you Amherst Media uh, mm -hmm. for supporting us in this, that the community can access information. Uh, what we've learned over the last few years is that no one medium does it for everybody. Some mm -hmm. people love going to a website. They can do it in the privacy of their own phone or home or wherever they mm -hmm. are. Some people really like the interactive, what feels interactive about viewing a video like this. They can get information on their TV uh, or again online. Other people really like to go to meetings mm -hmm. uh, and be able to voice that. And, and we're open to all of those, um, those things. We'll set up an email account for the school building committee so they also can uh, get, we don't know what it, quite what the address will be yet, we'll share that out, so that if a member of the public wants to email the whole building committee, they're a public body and, mm -hmm. and they can, um, that the public has access to be able to email them questions, concerns, um, suggestions or compliments. Mm -hmm. So we, we want that um, ongoing iterative process to, to truly involve everyone in the community. And all of the school building committee meetings will be open to the public and anyone can attend. And they'll all have public comment yeah. periods, absolutely. Yeah. Good, yeah. excellent. So have you chosen a site? I mean, the, the application was for Fort River. Um, we had put in for Wildwood and Fort River and they said no to Wildwood, they said yes to Fort River. But does that mean that it's going to be at Fort River or how does that all work? And how does the work that we've already done on Fort River um, in the last couple of years, which is a tremendous amount of work by a very dedicated committee. How does that play into these decisions? Sure, and that, that's a question I've gotten the most often, I think, since mm -hmm. we got in, was uh, I think there is some confusion. So uh, any MSBA project has to look at every site that's viable in the community. We know from the Wildwood site that the town of Amherst doesn't have a tremendous number of viable sites um, because we, we've done that process. Mm -hmm. And uh, what I can say confidently is that the building committee will likely look at both of those sites. No decision's been made. It should be, it has to be at Fort River or it'll be at Wildwood if it's a consolidation. None of those decisions have been made. The great news is we have a tremendous amount of data. Uh, what I've shared with the MSBA is we have more data about those two sites than any other district that got into their process. That I'm confident in. Uh, the prior site looked and, and was, it got some on Fort River, but was heavily invested in, in understanding the site and, and we have a tremendous amount of data from there. And as you noted, the Fort River Feasibility Committee has a similar amount of information on the Fort River site. So really what, uh, what I imagine happening is, you know, we have to figure out what we're studying, but if we're looking at some building that would resolve in both of those buildings being offline, um, or those schools being offline as a result of the project, that we would have a matrix of options, a matrix to rate the different sites. There's mm -hmm. going to be benefits. Some is based on location. Some's going to be based on soil testing. Some's going to be based on the topography of the site. They're really different in terms of topography. And so that'll be for a building committee to weigh multiple of those options, look at the matrix, get feedback from the community, and eventually make a decision what the site, what site would be best. Mm -hmm. But at this point, there is no, um, no site's been chosen and I don't have a, people are like, well, what do you think? Do you have a preference? <laughs> and uh, one of the, I'm not great at lots of things. One of the things I am good at is I know what I know and I know what I don't know. Okay. And uh, understanding the, the, the details is that's why we have consultants who mm -hmm. come and, and help us understand in great detail what the benefits and drawbacks of each mm -hmm. site would be to weigh those options, and that'll be for the committee to weigh in on. Mm -hmm. um, so at this point, there's no front runner, there's no, uh, there's no preferred site. It's, we know both sites are viable, and we want to figure out what the best one for the, for the community is and what it's going to be for 50 years. Mm -hmm. I mean, just one other wrinkle that I've gotten a lot of feedback on on both committees as well as continue to is with climate change uh, occurring, you know, what do we think about 50 years from now, what will be the best site? Mm -hmm. What do we think with development in Amherst? What will be the best site? Uh, thinking not just about the climate and the soil, but just in the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. uh, if both of those are on the table. Um, so all those factors weigh into a pretty complex uh, decision-making matrix that I'm be glad that there'll be a committee to help us with. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's great. So, uh, if it's the case that one site is not selected mm -hmm. uh, and then becomes vacant, um, what happens to that, that site? That's another question I receive a lot. Mm -hmm. So the sites, uh, both sites, that we were, if those are the two sites, Wildwood and Fort River, are under the control of the school committee. If the school committee determines that it no longer needs those sites, they would say, I don't need them anymore, and they'd refer them back to the town. And then um, there is, no one knows what will happen with that. There's, that has not even come up very much, and it would be up to the council to ultimately decide what, how to dispose. They may say, let's put this piece of property back on the tax rolls. They may say, let's use it for a town use or a school use or a secondary school use, secondary, uh, ancillary school use. I think the limit is only to left to someone's imagination. So there, this is a, um, 
a process that will be discussed very publicly because I think people will care a lot about what happens to the vacant sites. Um, so it, it also could be used for, as a, for another town priority, like for open space or for affordable housing. But again, we're well, that's, that's years down the road. We have to choose which site first, and then that conversation can begin. Yeah, and we have, some, we have a track record. I mean, for instance, the East Street School uh, as yep. being an example, which was used, um, actually historically was used by the school department and then wasn't, and then was yep. again as an annex to Fort River. Um, and then was, um, since it wasn't being used for an educational purpose, mm -hmm. went back to the town, and mm -hmm. not that you have to go into all that, but then the town has, has had its process to determine use of that site. Mm -hmm. uh, and I would imagine this would be, while the scale's different, the process is, is pretty similar. Right. So one of the things that comes up frequently is uh, the town council has um, been pretty clear about its commitment to climate action and uh, managing uh, all of our town affairs with an eye towards sustainability. And how will that work into the feasibility study, and how would you integrate those values into a feasibility study? Yeah, so climate justice is something that I know we, we talk a lot about even on the school side. We recently were fortunate enough to apply for and receive a grant from Eversource to um, get 50 some odd thousand dollars of LED lights over at Crocker Farm. We've done it on our own uh, dime with some incentives at the high school mm -hmm. um, and at other sites. And so this being a joint project, I think there's a shared commitment to climate justice, what we know is that these will, uh, what result would be a much more energy efficient building than what currently exists and we feel really good about that. And any consultant that we, is hired uh, has to have a, what's called a, a green consultant, actually like a designer, so someone who specializes in uh, sustainable construction. I think this project, and I think anyone who bids on this project will, will fully understand on the front end that that's a real value of the community. Mm -hmm. It's not kind of lip service, it's yep. people are going to have high expectations around that. The Fort River Feasibility Study, a good example of having interesting debate as well as the, the, the existing one before this bylaw existed about do we want to be lead silver, do we need to be lead gold, and uh, uh, all these kind of categorizations of energy efficiency and sustainability. I, I look forward to that town council debate um, <laughs> about that topic. Uh, I know the um, ECAC, which you'll be able to do that. Energy and Climate Action Committee. Yeah, which is um, kind of a subsection or subcommittee. It's a committee of the, yeah. Of, of the, the town council. Mm -hmm. um, they, they've expressed some interest and, and connected and had some thoughts, initial thoughts, that they want to share with us as being experts in that area. Um, we are, we have the commitment. Uh, we're not experts in explicitly in that area, and that's why we rely on both our local experts um, like that group, but also a green consultant to, to work on that. I know the most, uh, what's been billed as the most sustainable school building uh, in Massachusetts was built in Cambridge, not that, it was completed not that long ago, mm -hmm. MLK, um, and they aimed for uh, net zero. They didn't get quite, they got mm -hmm. near net zero mm -hmm. with, net, with, as technology changes, they'll right. be able to adjust that. Um, there was a, a site visit I wasn't able to go on uh, last year, I believe, but uh, we have a lot of the information from that resource. And I think one thing to note, I was sharing this with someone last week, actually, is um, these weren't architects flown in from Arizona or California. The architects were based in Boston. Mm -hmm. uh, the consultants were based locally. Mm -hmm. So as the field emerges, we do have, we, there's some perception that we'll have to rely on some technology that's only um, only uh, used if you're in the Sun Belt or mm -hmm. something like mm -hmm. that. And we've got some counterexamples to that um, that we're starting to gather information about and uh, we'll look forward to that process moving forward. But I think that is a, 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 a crucial juncture of where the school interests um, to reduce operating costs over time mm -hmm. as well as the climate justice really align so closely with the town interests as well. So, so I think, you know, Amherst is a leader in climate, in addressing climate um, change and has you know, the home of two living buildings, which no other right. community is, has that. Um, but I think you're right. If you say, if, suppose we go from two buildings to one building, that carbon footprint alone with a near or net zero building will be dramatic, it will have a dramatic impact on the town's carbon output. Yeah, yeah and we know our buildings right now, were, they were built in the early 70s, they were not built with that in mind, not, and the technology wasn't there. Mm -hmm. um, so. I think that's going to be a unique part of our process. Uh, MSB is aware of that unique mm -hmm. part of our process, <laughs> and, and they're excited for the ride. Yeah, so, great. Um, well, I think we're just about out of time, but um, I want to, again, thank you for taking time out of your busy day mm -hmm. to talk MSBA. I know it's certainly something that people in the community are interested in, care a lot about, and are raring to go for, as, as we are as well. 
Um, again, I'm Mike Morris. Uh, any comments, questions, morrism at arps.org. We're always interested in hearing feedback. And we'll be back soon with another episode of Window into ARPS. Thank you for watching.